During one of my live streams, I live stream by the way, my chat started recommending manga to me. And among those names, there was one that stood out. The Spicy Ninja Scrolls. While I didn't recognize the name of the manga, I did recognize the name of the author, Hinoshita Jiro. For those that don't know, he's the guy who draws all the best boys in Asamo, so I immediately bought the entire series. As always, there's a link to them in the description. The first three volumes are free, so don't hesitate to give them a try. So let's unfurl these spicy ninja scrolls and see what they have to offer in Volume 1. Immediately, we're introduced to this medieval Japanese world called Yamato. Ninjas thrived during this period, but as the war ended, they found a new place in society as mercenaries taking on these ninjobs, a name that made me giggle more than it should. We have three main characters who we are introduced to in short order. The first of which being this green country bumpkin of a dog who aspires to be a ninja. I really like his design. It's small, it's cute, and it doesn't need to be anything other than that. Our protagonist's power is the Shin Tsuriki. It lets him seemingly do anything, but mostly grow his mallet to impossible sizes. A power he uses to save another dog? I'm guessing he's a dog. Name Shichimi. Despite being a jealous hothead with a penchant for gambling, he is without a doubt a ninja of the Misty Mountain. The mountain gets its name because it's guarded by a pure white divine mist produced at the hand of their master, Goki. Okay, so a uh, quick question, does anyone know of any good uh, doujins featuring Goki? Asking for a friend. He's the one who names our protagonist Wasabi, who's now a member of the spicy ninja clan. This is also where we meet our third and final main protagonist, Roshi. Quick side note, this is actually why it's called the Spicy Ninja Scrolls, cause its three main protags are named after spicy stuff. Wasabi is... Wasabi, Shichimi is a spicy chili blend, and Roshi is grated daikon radish. Took me way too long to figure that out. What I really like about these three main characters is the way they're different. It's clear enough in their titles, Oroshi is the shinobi of the body, he possesses the highest physical prowess of the trio. He's not only able to cross blades with most of their foes, but comes with the ability to manipulate ice. However, to contrast from his physical skills and to go with his ice arts, Oroshi has the lowest interpersonal skills of the group. He comes off as cold and uncaring, just outright saying that Wasabi is not cut out to be a ninja, much to the latter's dismay. Shichimi, on the other hand, is the shinobi of skills and is the inverse of Oroshi. He's great with other people and rather than having a magic technique, he uses more gimmicky, sciencey tricks to breathe fire and stuff of the like. However, the lack of actual magic to back him up leaves him feeling vulnerable through his veneer of fake confidence. It's ironic that the shinobi of skills feels that his skills aren't enough. And finally, our protagonist, Wasabi, is the shinobi of heart. He's the youngest of the group and lacks the body or the skills or even the experience of the others, but makes up for it in passion. He has an immense desire to be useful and his magic, the Shinsuriki, literally makes wishes reality. He just needs to learn how to control it, which is the main focus of the first quarter of the series. It honestly gives the story a very familiar feeling to early Naruto. For the first quarter of the series, you and the protagonist are literally learning about the abilities they didn't know they had. The rest of the series is focused on the protagonist earning the right to the powers they were born into. I could keep going, but I'll have to stop there, because like I said, this video is only focused on the first three volumes of the Spicy Ninja Scrolls. I'm specifically doing the first three volumes because the series is broken up into parts going by threes. The first part is when the series is at its simplest. Do you remember that Warlord Utama I mentioned before? Well, he's still lingering in the shadows and he seeks the Shinsuriki. Using magic talismans, a born named Tonza and a bat named Sobro cause a very generalized mayhem. Sometimes they're plaguing a road with a living wall or maybe they're harassing a town using... totally awesome? From a writing standpoint, I really like this since it's a good way to introduce us to the world and other important characters like Konatsu. She's a former comrade of Goki who now works for the shogun Tokumori. 
I like her as a narrative tool because she can replace her protagonist as the point of view, letting her and Goki discuss things while her protagonist remain ignorant. It lets the series keep a jovial tone and carefree protagonist while letting the audience be aware of the danger and very real stakes behind each battle. The early volumes follow a very monster of the week, or well, monster of the chapter, formula. Despite how that formula can easily get repetitive and boring, the manga makes very good use of it to introduce the world and characters. We meet just about every important character in these first three volumes. From the jovial comic relief like the previously mentioned Konatsu and Tonza, to the enigmatic ones like Utama's silent and mysterious ninja Sumi and the Man of the Divine Tree in Seki. There's a hidden joke in what I just said, but only people who've read the manga will get it, hint hint. Real quick, since we're like halfway through the video, do remember to like and subscribe and donate to my Kofi and Patreon. Supporters get cool rewards like access to the Discord server and early viewing for my videos. Now back to what I was saying about the characters in Spicy Ninja Scrolls. My favorite of the bunch has to be Benkei. Not only is he based on Oniwaka Benkei, and you know how much I love my folklore and myths, but he's such a great character because he's just so lovably weird. A massive mountain of a man. No, wait, actually a massive mountain of a teenager because he's just 14. He knows Wasabi from before the series started. He's even the one who gave Wasabi his wooden mallet. Benkei seeks the ultimate weapon, so he takes the mallet back, but realizes Wasabi has the magic, so he opts to take Wasabi's hand in marriage. That's what makes Benkei the embodiment of what makes this manga so strong. As you should expect, these early parts are focused on setup, laying down the foundation that the rest of the series will stand on. That's why I like the Monster of the Week style, it lets the characters travel around so we get a really good look at where they live. But world building can only get you so far, it's not enough to carry an entire series. What carries you through the early chapters and even what lies ahead is the spicy Ninja Scrolls' wonderful sense of humor. From classic jokes like Konatsu's age, to Tanzo once again being made the butt of the joke, even Mariah Carey of all things, didn't expect that in a Japanese manga. Props not only to the author, but also a Praxis, the translator, and Omega Lupus, the editor and localizer. They both did a fantastic job not only making sure that the jokes land, but that everything flows together quite nicely. And I don't just mean the jokes within the story, I'm also including these little gag images after every chapter. They contain some of my favorite jokes in the entire manga, this image in particular is always worth a lol, and perhaps even Lamau. The sense of humor really does help carry it through the early volumes because it's worth seeing what joke comes next. Benkei himself is comedic and just how positive but inept at common sense he is. He means well, he just doesn't know the right way to go about… anything really. Even better, him trying to pull a Bowser and marry Wasabi gives way to a pretty good fight. While the choreography is bland, I really like the way the action is handled. As I mentioned before, each of our three protagonists fight in different ways. Oroshi uses ice and physical skills, Shichimi relies on tricks and fire, and Wasabi is Hashirama. This helps make fights feel more dynamic and interesting because no two characters will approach battle in the same way. But it also gives us information about the characters themselves. Oroshi is strong and stalwart, but he's also cold and distant, always doing what he's told lest his entire worldview shatter just like ice. Shichimi is impulsive and creative, so he uses fire and explosives, but if he doesn't keep control of himself, he can easily hurt others. Wasabi nurtures the good in others, letting them flourish and grow like plants, but he also has to make sure that he himself also gets what he needs to grow. What's even better writing is that the same concept also applies to the villains. Let's use Sobero and Tanza, for example. Both of them use magic talismans to give them help, but they both do it in different ways. 
Sobero conjures paper copies of himself used to overwhelm and strike at the opponent's blind spot. Tunza, on the other hand, uses the talismans to create more gimmicky monster of the week creatures. For Sobero, we aren't even sure if Sobero is his name, and he regularly uses disguises, thus his fighting style relies on trickery. I can't get into it too much because spoilers, but how flimsy his copies are also belies his physical frailty and desire to run away from danger. On the other hand, Tanza, despite being a shinobi, is loud and bombastic for better or worse. And despite being the butt of the joke, he's fiercely loyal and a good person, investing actual interest into the well-being of those beneath him and even his enemies. These two probably have my favorite relationship out of any characters in the series. They're both henchmen who get their hands dirty at the behest of those above them. But seeing them slowly bond over their lots in life is wonderful storytelling. I can only say so much when I'm restricted to the first three volumes, which is why I'm really recommending you read it. Seeing all these relationships built up over the volumes only works because the story is very well constructed. Even throughout the earliest chapters, things are foreshadowed that become important later. Small moments that I can't be too specific about add up for some of the best reveals in the series. Things aren't important for volumes and volumes only to be brought up later as all the puzzle pieces fit into place. I really don't want to spoil things, but there is one moment I'm going to begrudgingly talk about from volumes 4 and 5. If you don't want spoilers, move on to this timestamp. You'll know the spoilers are over when I switch from this background. Okay, so in Volume 4, we get one of those classic moments. Wasabi wants to leave, but Goki says no, so he poisons his tea so he can go out and help his friends. But in Volume 5, we get Goki's perspective. The poison tea never worked, but in the intermeaning time, we get to see something we didn't before. Goki gets into a fight that he loses, and we get a repeat of a panel from a different point of view. Goki was not knocked out, he was bleeding out. When the realization hits and you're suddenly like, what is better than crack? In short, the entire Spicy Ninja Scrolls are so much fun to read and reread. The humor keeps you reading through the early parts, but when you get to the latter half, you're hit with something intense. The themes of family and self-worth stop just existing for jokes and instead become heavy topics to focus on. And the story manages to tackle both these themes and tones with astounding finesse, seamlessly blending the two together. I am absolutely recommending you read The Spicy Ninja Scrolls. The first three volumes are free, and like I've said many times throughout this video, there's a link down below. While the review may be over, this video sure isn't because we still have to do our Patreon shoutouts. For our three stars, we have special thanks to 87 Werehog, Deku, Zora Chow, Choron, Garon Lefay, Dragon King Yara, Anon RC, Lightning Shadow, and Kayun. For four stars, we have Miki Moon, the Dusk Dragon. And for our Super D Tooper special five star shoutouts, we have. First, Vanilla Flower, the Super Producer. Then, Poor Mage, the Tri Brigade Arms. Next, Sky King 64, the Virtuous. And finally, Mahogasaur, the Wings of Resonant Life. Thank you for watching. Do be sure to like and subscribe. As always, I'm your host, Fury, signing out.